let's get started. Uh, it's a little bit more of an intimate group, so obviously if there's questions at any point, feel free to ask. Uh, and then if you have something that's not related to the presentation at all, but just another art question, feel free to ask once like, well, those questions uh, after the presentation, because we'll, we'll have, I'm sure we'll have uh, that opportunity to do so. So today we'll be talking about unique R objects, and I'll briefly go over the course uh, description and then the general themes of what was planned for this semester. Um, and then we'll, the two primary objects that we'll briefly talk about are factors and lists. And then we'll talk about what um, the reshape two package authors call a molten object, which is primarily used through the melt function. And the melt function is important because it's used a lot for getting data ready to use in ggplot2. And ggplot2 is a really big data visualization package, and it has a lot of uh, support and enthusiasm in the R community, so it's important to understand how melt objects work, and so that's why we'll go over that today. So the general outline is that it's a one hour talk. Um, this was the second session in the three course session for the semester um, and again if you have any uh, questions feel free to ask at any point and so again the idea was start out with partitioning data and loading data into R uh, then today's session and then the day three which we don't have time for this semester is getting clean data for ggplot2 um, but at the end of these slides I did a very a brief few slides on ggplot2 so we, if there's extra time, we can go over those and kind of get a little taste for what ggplot2 has to offer. So, to get right into it, uh, let's talk about factors. Factors are essentially special objects that enable uh, R to know that you have groups or categories. So, for example, if you have uh, some different, like if you have different uh, fast food options. You have like hamburgers, pizza, hot dogs, right? Those are three categories. So those, those three factors would be hamburgers, hot dogs, uh, pizza. Uh, another one is dogs, cats, foxes. Those are three distinct animals. Uh, and so those would be three different factors. And factors are used a lot in ggplot2, which is why we'll be talking about uh, factors today and kind of understanding how they work. So let's do an example. So let's open R. And what we're gonna do is first we're just gonna create a vector with some character data. So we're gonna call that vector animals. Well, that's animals less than dash C, parentheses, quote, dog, end quote, comma, quote, dog, end quote, comma, quote, fox, end quote, comma, quote, cat, quote, comma, quote, dog, quote, comma, quote, fox, quote, and parentheses. So now let's look at animals, the, that object. So we have dog, dog, fox, cat, dog, fox. And that looks like typical character data, so everything seems to be working well perfectly. So now let's uh, translate this into a factor. So it's just going to do FCTS. Whoops for fac factors, uh, so facts less than dash as factor, parentheses animals, and now if we look at facts, we have the order dog, dog, fox, cat, dog, fox, and then levels. So this immediately tells you, okay, I have uh, these objects, these this data here in this object, and it has three different levels, and it alph uh, alphabetized those different levels for me, so I can immediately get a quick summary of this, these three different things in, uh, in my object. Uh, and so notice also that th even though this is character data, the parentheses went away for factors. So that's something to be aware of and to be cognitive of when you're doing an analysis. Okay. 
Any questions or no? Okay. So let's go back. So the next kind of object that we'll talk about is lists. Lists, remember from last time we've had a discussion, we talked about data frames, how data frames are very flexible, but you don't necessarily know if it is numeric data, character data, etc. Lists are even more flexible. They can pull all sorts of kinds of data in all different sizes and different shapes and sizes. They're very flexible for that, which is great. The problem is, is that they can be kind of confusing about what exactly, what kind of data you're working with exactly. But a lot of, uh, it's, not, it's not unheard of to, when you do more complicated analyses that you get a lot of things back and all those things are sometimes held in lists. So it's important to be able to realize, okay, this is what a list is and this is how I can deal with it and move forward, okay? So let's do an example. We'll start off very simple. We'll start off with it, just creating some, a numeric object, x. Uh, so x equals c, parentheses, one, two, three. Let's look at x. And there's our numeric data, right? Mm -hmm. So now let's create some character data. Let's call that object y. So y equals c, parentheses, quote, one, end quote, comma, quote, 100, quote, comma, quote, fox, quote, comma. And so now let's look at y. And so now this has 100 fox. So again, this is all stuff that we've seen. But now moving forward, let's create a list from these two objects. So we're going to do that using the list function and then the objects that we want to use. So it's going to be z equals list, parentheses, x comma y. And so now let's look at z. So here, can you see this red dot with the glare? Mm -hmm. OK. So as you can see, the, there's this double bracket 1, and then, one, and then bracket 1, 1, 2, 3, and then double bracket 2 bracket one, one hundred box. So here, it keeps the, it lets you know that this is still character data for the, the second thing in your list. But for the first thing, it's numeric data, right? Because that's our numeric object. So basically what you can do with lists is that you can combine different objects of different sizes and types together in one, in one object so that it's all together. And then basically to retrieve that information from the first list, you're basically going to use two brackets and then retrieve that. So let's look at that for example. Let's look at that for a sec. So we're going to, to get back those numbers, one, two, three, all we're going to do is do z, bracket, bracket, one, bracket, bracket. And now I got my first object. So now I got those, those numbers again. But let's say I wanted the first number from the first thing in the list, mm -hmm. right? So if I wanted that number one, what I would have to do is I'd have to say, okay, I want z bracket bracket one bracket bracket. So I want that first object, mm -hmm. okay? Now imagine if I just had, like, if I was just writing x, if I just, if I, if I wanted to get the first thing from x, what would I type? So like, if I just had x, right, there's x. If I wanted just to get one, how would I get one from x? I'll give you a hint, x, bracket, bracket, there's something missing in the middle. One? Yeah. So I want the first thing in that, in that mm -hmm. object, okay. So now, now I have z bracket bracket one bracket bracket. That's getting me object x. So now what do you think I'm gonna want to type to get the number one out? Is it just another bracket one after it? 
Exactly. So this is basically saying get the first op get the first thing in my list. Okay, now that I have my first thing, get me, this is saying get me the first cell in that object. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Okay. So, let's look at, so there's a, con so like if we wanted to get the length, like how big is the first thing in our list? We can use the length function, right? And we do length z bracket bracket one bracket bracket and parentheses and three. So that tells us that the the first thing in our list is has three cells or three subparts in it, right? Notice that when we do length z, it just says two. That's saying, okay, I have two things in on my list two different objects that I put on that list, okay? And so just to really drive this home, if I want the second thing on my list Z, I'm gonna do Z bracket bracket two, right? I got one, 100 fox, but if I want the third thing, I'm gonna do Z bracket bracket two, bracket bracket bracket, and then three, and that's gonna get me fox. Okay. Yes. Just to clarify, I guess like a little bit of review. If we didn't have a list and so we had just a vector, how would the notation change? Or if you wanted just to like take the one out of it. So again, so for just a vector, so we have x. That's a vector. Yeah. Right. And so if I just want the one, mm -hmm. I would do x bracket one bracket okay. one. So it's the exact same thing. Yeah. So basically, yeah. So basically, like uh, where was it? Up so see here, mm -hmm. so this is saying z bracket bracket one bracket bracket. That's like, you, now you can translate that. That's yeah. like, oh, that's object x, right? So the computer's like, okay, that's object x, and then from x, get the first thing. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Okay. <clears throat> so this was creating a list from two objects that we already had. Let's create a list directly now, mm -hmm. okay? So let's create an object, a list called maths equals list, parentheses C, parentheses, and then just some numbers. So five, 10, 15, bracket, or parentheses, comma, C, parentheses one, two, five, bracket, or parentheses, parentheses. So what's happening, happening here is that I'm saying, okay, create a list, and let the first thing in that list be, have this information on it. It's gonna be this vector, numeric vector, and then comma, and then the second thing is gonna be this, this other vector, one, two, five, right? So when we hit enter, and we look at maths, you see that there's two things on our list, and they both have three numbers. Right, and we could do all those same operations. So like if I want to take the sum of the first thing on the list, I would do sum maths bracket bracket one, bracket bracket, bracket one, bracket, and I could get that sum. Or well that's just the that's just five, right? If I want the the sum of everything, that's I don't take. I don't get just the first object. Right, I want every, the sum of all the things on the first list, so that's just bracket, bracket one, bracket, bracket. Notice here that if you try to take the sum of a list full of numeric data, you can't do that. So you lose some functionality, and that's important to keep in note in your mind. Because remember, with data frames. When we created data frames by combining a bunch of vectors of numeric data, we can still take the sum. This one we can't. But if you go to the specific object and say, I want to take the sum of that thing on that list, I can take the sum of that. So again, very flexible for combining lots of different objects into one, one object, mm -hmm. but it's still not exactly completely copacetic 
with one another. But we can't, what, let's see what happens when we try to convert it to a data frame. And let's see what happens. So df less than dash as dot data, whoops, as dot data dot frame parentheses max. And then when we, so the as dot data frame converts it to a data frame. And when we look at df, it has these weird names, column names, but then it, it automatically converted all the information to a nice matrix-like formulation. So, but you can see that since it, it had, it, it, this weird name just came from basically when we created the, the list, it's kind of a derivative of that, where it's uh, basically you have these periods instead of parentheses and commas and stuff. So it's just, it's, it's coming from that. But now, we can take this off. So if you have a bunch of, a lot of like numeric data and just want to convert it, from a list and to get the sum of it, you can just do, you don't even have to convert it directly, like create a new object, right? You could do sum as.data.frame maths, right? So this is a nested function where what we're doing is first we're, we're converting our list to a data frame. And then as soon as we get that data frame, we take the sum of it and that's what that is. But we're not creating a new object. Right? Okay. Let's, so note, you can't, so like remember our, our list Z, that doesn't work when you take, try to take the sum of that because we have character data. And, but it does convert it to a data frame, right? So we still have, just for reminding you, so here's Z, right? That's, we're, we're, we're comfortable with that. And then when we just convert it to a data frame, it still looks a lot like the, the numeric conversion where you have this, these weird column names, right? But remember the data frame doesn't retain the parentheses. So that's why it got rid of the parentheses here and you can't take the sum of that because it has character data, but you just don't have parentheses, so it doesn't immediately, it's not immediately obvious. Any questions so far? No? Okay. Okay. So like I said before, a uh, molten object is really helpful for, re for reformatting the data to be really uh, usable for very complicated plots in ggplot2. Uh, and it's a form of data cleaning and data partitioning that really um, eases that. And when I initially learned about Melt, it made no sense to me, but after I used it more and more, uh, it became integral to creating graphics that I use on a daily basis. So even if today you walk away saying like that was such a weird thing, I don't understand what the heck is going on, that's how I felt, but I encourage you to challenge yourself and continue using it because it will be helpful for creating really complex plots very easily. Okay? So let's try to get a handle on what this data or what this uh, molten object is first. Okay? So but let's load some data, some actual data. So to do that, we're going to use some built-in data right into from R using the data function. So data parentheses iris and this is the famous Irish uh, iris data set uh, created by Anderson uh, and Fisher or you famously used by Anderson and Fisher so let's look at the first 
the, the top of the data set and just kind of look at and see what we have here, just to remind ourselves. Uh, it's going on a couple lines, so I apologize for that. But basically you have sepal length as the first column, sepal width as the second, petal length, petal width, and then the species. And you can see that it's a toe-sa. <laughs> it's just carried on to the next line. I don't have a big screen, I apologize. Uh, so, but that is our data. So let's look at the dimension using dim. So dim parentheses uh, iris. And so it's 150 rows by five columns. And that makes sense because we saw five columns previously when we looked at the header, right? So let's just part partition the first 50, right? So let's, let's, let's create a new object called my data, less than dash, iris, bracket, and then the first 50 observations, so 1 colon 50 parentheses bracket, right? So now if we do dimension my data 50, 5. So that's saying I have 50 observations with 5 columns. So again, so if you use the, if you use the function tail, that looks at the bottom 5 observations. So if I were to do that with my iris data, You can see that it's the species of Virginica, but if I do that with my data, again, it's Tosa. So just kind of reinforcing this, yes, that we did this correctly, that this is getting a partition of the data, reminding ourselves of some partitioning tools, etc. But then let's only look at so let's create another object where it's just the second and third row, or second and third column, excuse me. So let's call that my data two, less than dash, iris, bracket, comma, two, colon, three. Right? And so then if we look at the dimension of my data two, we see that we have 150 rows and only two columns. So again, it's only sepal width and pedal length. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was just a lot of build up. We didn't even talk about the melt function yet. We're just <laughs> reminding ourselves of some partitioning tools. So to first, we have to install, uh, if you don't have it already, the reshape2 package. So to do that, you do, again, install packages, uh, parentheses, co uh, quote, reshape, to end quote parentheses and so then it's going to do something like this and you're going to select uh, a crayon mirror where to go and download it i typically use the new york uh, uh database because it's i i don't run into issues with them i run into issues with lots of other places for some reason uh, but new york which is right here don't run into issues with them so i do i use them I already have this, I'm not going to re-download it, so, but if you don't have it, definitely download it. Uh, but if you do have it, then all you have to do is do library, parentheses, and then reshape to, and then you should just, it should have worked, and just go on to the next line. Okay? Okay. So let's look at the melt function documentation. So I did that using question mark melt, and then the official R documentation came up. So this is telling us that there's, here's the description for the melt function, but what I want to bring your attention to is that this says, okay, here they're doing melt.data.frame for data frames, melt.array for arrays, matrices, and tables, melt.list for lists. So depending on the object you do, Melt automatically can detect it and does something different for those different object types. So Melt is really important to understand what object you're putting in there before it automatically determines what's happening. 
but we're going to be using um, data frame primarily. So to kind of understand how that works, uh, if you wanted to understand how it how it takes in uh, data frames, you could just do melt dot data dot frame, and now it's going to tell you, okay, this is what we do when we take in data frames, right? But you have to go to that specific uh, sub function, if you will, to get more details on that and not just the general one, okay? So, okay, so now let's create a new object uh, using the melt function. So to do that, we'll do iris dot new, less than dash, melt, parentheses, and the data will just be iris comma, and then I'm not going to describe, explain what this is doing or what I'm typing in and what it means. We're just going to type it, then we're going to look at it and see what happened. I think that's the best way to kind of understand how melt works. So comma, I, comma id dot vars equals species. Okay. And now let's look at it. There's a function called view that will bring up an Excel-like spreadsheet version of your object. Capital V. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So can everyone so in our, in our studio, I think it, what it does is it just brings up, it makes your, it shows the object in one of your panels, mm -hmm. but in base R, it just loads like a little window like this. So basically, this is what we see. In case you can't read it, the first column is species, and then the second column is variable, and then the third column is value. Okay. So... What's happening here is that we have species, satosa, 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 okay. So all the satosas are there. And then it has variables. So sepal length, sepal length, sepal length, sepal length. Okay, they're all sepal length. So it's organizing it in some fashion regarding, and then the value over on the, on the third one. Right, so it's organizing it somehow using species and variable, right? So if we were to look down here more, I have to use the, the keyboard. Let's see what happens. Okay, it finally changed. Nope. Yes. Finally did change. Species at number 51 became varus color. Right? But sepal length is the same. Okay. So now what appears to be happening is that the first column is going through the different species while holding the variable constant. So it's going to do all sepal lengths and then organize them by species with that value. And then it's going to do that for, um, we're guessing, right, for every variable, right? So let's go down, let's see what happens when the next change is. Okay. Yes. So here on 100, we have varus color in the species, but it's still sepal length, right? So now if we keep them going down, <coughs> okay. Finally, sepal length is gone. It's on line 151, row 151, it's now sepal width, but it went back to satosa. So you see what's happening here? It reorganized our 150 by five original object into this very large number of rows. Let's look at it, dimension iris.new. 600 rows by three columns. So it reorganized it in this way, right? Such that 
all the, the values that those combinations have is on, all, is on the third one. It's going through all the variables systematically, so all sequel length, and all sequel width, and all petal length, etc. But then it's going to change the species on the, all the way on the left. So our ID var is saying, okay, this is what we're going to go through for each of the remaining variables, right? So, for example, if this was, if you had gender where it was only male and female, right, and that, and your gender was your ID vars, it would do, it would do all the Fs first, but it would do F, then male for, let's say, um, GPA, right? So it would do all the GPA variables and those values with F first, because that's alphabetized, right? F and then M. Mm -hmm. So then it would be like F, if let's say you had 10 of each, you'd have 10 Fs and then 10 Ms, so tw uh, but 20 GPA variables, right? And then those values. And then we go on the next variable with F, M, that variable, et cetera. Does that make sense? So again, just to kind of really drive this home, all you have to do with using the reshape2 package is that you have your data that you're using and then the ID bars. This is the, the crux of how to use this and your species is what we chose for this one. And basically species are our categories, right? Mm. So it's a, it could be a factor, right? Like cat, dog, fox, etc. Basically you're gonna put a, some kind of grouping there Okay. I've talked a lot. It's time for you to do an exercise. <laughs> so what I want you to do is I want you to install the dplyr package. It has access to some data sets that I want you that I want you to use. So I want you to use this following code where you open the open the package, uh, load this NASA data set, and then convert it to a data frame. And then use the melt on the surf temp and temperature variables grouped by the year. So I only want you to get use the surf temp and the temperature variables, and I want you to group them by the year. So see if you can translate that verbal action into code using the melt function. Then I want you to save that resulting data as a CSV and then reload it back into your workspace. And ensure that you are reloading it, not just opening the object that you had just apparently saved. Uh, and so you have 10 minutes, and I'll be around if you have any questions, okay? So, first steps again are just what I posted before. You're gonna ins install the package if you don't have it, load it if you haven't already loaded it, and then you're gonna get the NASA data. So let's just look at the, the, the dimensionality of NASA. Okay, it's this, it says it has over 40,000 rows and four columns. That's a lot. But that doesn't look like a matrix. Because there are other objects that I have not even touched on. So just be aware of that. I'm not gonna get into what this is. But what's great is that you can probably convert it to something you do know about, which is why I had you convert it to a data frame. So I'm gonna do my dat less than dash as dot data dot frame NASA. And now if we look at the dimensionality of my dat, okay, still 40, 000, over 40,000 rows, but there's 11, there's 11, columns. And I know it's columns because it's a data frame. I know what I'm working with now. I don't even have to look. I can, now that I know it's a data frame, I know exactly, I can imagine what this looks like, but I don't have to see it, right? But I'm going to just to kind of make sure that we understand what's going on. So if I do view my dat, what comes up is, an, again, an Excel-like spreadsheet. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So we have lots of different things. We have latitude, longitude, month, year, cloud, etc. Uh, there's just so many different things here, right? I didn't want you to use all of this though, right? I wanted you to just get uh, the fourth column and the tenth and eleventh. So I wanted you to get the tenth and eleventh, the surf temp and temperature columns. So there's surf temp and temperature. And then I wanted you to get the fourth, the fourth column, the year column. So I wanted, because that's what I wanted you to sort everything by, right? So this is big and bulky and hard to see. So let's just get that partition and see what the final thing should look like. So we're going to do subs as our new object, less than dash, uh, C bind, right? Because that combines multiple different objects together. So I'm going to do my dat. Uh, bracket comma four, close bracket comma, and then my dat bracket comma ten colon eleven. So this is getting this is getting the fourth column of my dat, which is year, and then it's also getting the tenth and eleventh column of my dat, which is temperature and pressure, and then it's going to combine them into one object, and it's going to combine them by the columns. And I'm going to assign that to a new object that I'm going to call subs. So now if I look at the dimensionality of subs, it's over 40,000 observations, but three rows. So if I look at the head of subs, there it is. So my dat, it didn't, ha it didn't retain the, the name, right? So I'm going to have to change that uh, so that it's a little bit more legible for viewers. But I can do that, but then I got surface temperature and temperature, which is what I wanted. I might have said pressure before, I didn't want that. I apologize. Um, so to change the name, I'm going to do call names, parentheses, uh, subs, and parentheses, less than dash, or bracket one, because I only want to change the first. So if I do this, right, if I just do call name subs, it gives my dat bracket comma, four, et cetera, surf temp and temperature. If I just want to change the first column name, all I have to do is column name subs, bracket one, for, uh, less than dash, and then the new thing I want to change it to. So in this case, I want to change it to year. Now, if I do column name subs, you see year, surf temp, temperature. So I only changed the first one because I got the first, because this is giving me a vector of names, basically, right? Okay, I'm going to change it to a lowercase y. So now, let's create our new molten object. So I'm going to do new dot dat less than dash melt parentheses data equals subs comma id dot vars equals quote year. In parentheses. So now if I look at the dimensionality of new dat, it's this huge number of rows, over 80,000, but only three columns. So we still retain the same number of columns, but we organize things. So again, we can just check that. See, it looks very different from our original data that we, the, the subs object, right? It reorganized it essentially, and we went over how that reorganization looks and done, is performed, right? So, in my directory, or this this is what's in my workspace: my dat NASA new uh, new dat subs. But if I look in my directory, I don't have anything. But I want to save this to a CSV, so I'm going to use the write CSV function. So I'm going to do write dot CSV parentheses new dot dat comma and then the name I want to give it so NASA underscore temp dot CSV uh, parentheses quotation parentheses so now if I look in my directory I see NASA temp but I still have all of my objects here to sort of make sure it's clear that I'm actually reloading this data from my, my directory into my workspace 
I'm going to remove everything using remove list equals list. So now if I look at my workspace, I don't have anything. So I can't do look at NASA or no, I can because that was preloaded in as from one of the packages. I can't look at um, NASA new, right? It's not found, right? Is that what I called it? Or subs rather. Can't find subs. I can't look at my dat, right? So I can look at NASA just because it comes pre-built into a package that I that I loaded. So now, now I want to reload that CSV file that I just created. So I'm going to do NASA underscore temp less than dash read dot table parentheses and then the op the file name. So NASA underscore temp dot CSV quote comma and then I already know what this CSV is or how it's organized. So I know that I need to put the header to true, uh, comma, sep equals, uh, quote, comma, parentheses. It ran the, the line. Now if I look at NASA temp, it's a little bit different than how, it, how we originally organized, but that's kind of part of uh, saving objects as CSVs and just cleaning data, but we went over that last time, so there shouldn't be any issues kind of cleaning this up. Uh, but now, this would be a perfect data set to use in GGBot2. Okay. So, are there any questions? Yes? How do you know which um, data sets are, I guess, are preloaded with R? There's uh, a couple different ways. So one is just do data. It's a, it's a function that mm -hmm. pulls the data, right? So you do question mark data. And it loads specified data sets or a list available of data sets. And it tells you more information about how to get those data and what's available. The, it might tell you that there's a link. Um, yeah, there's lots of, basically look at the documentation. It'll mm -hmm. explain everything to you. Um, and where and how it works and how it gets data and what's available, etc. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? No? Okay. So again, we don't have time because uh, it's been an hour, but the, there is a brief introduction to ggplot in the slides that come after this. So if you had free time during the moment right before finals and you were bored and didn't have anything to do, you could do this. But um, otherwise, I hope you have good luck on the rest of your semester. And if I don't see you, have a great summer. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yep.